Let me just say in preface to starting today, there's two ways predominantly that you can interpret the Bible. The first one is literally. The second one is allegorically. When we come to John chapter 3, verse 16, how do you treat that verse? I hope you treat it literally. When you come to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, how do you treat that verse? Okay, so by this point you should be saying, duh, we treat it literally. But just realize for a lot of evangelical Christianity, it's not that cut and dry. And so when I approach the scriptures, I am going to approach them literally, and I am going to claim what I am told in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, in which that for those of you who read the words of this prophecy, you will be happy, you will be blessed. So I'm going to take Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, as the inspired, literal word of God. I understand that there may be some usage of allegories to teach a point. But when we come to the rapture, I don't see that as an allegory or something that should be left behind. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we pray that you would guide us in our discussion this morning. Our thought is that we should just glorify your name and believe what the Bible says. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Left Behind is a series of 16 best-selling religious novels by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins. Has anybody read them through all the way? A few, a few. Has who has at least picked them up and read something? Still quite a few, great. It deals with a dispensational view of the end times. Uh, the series has been adapted into four major films, um, inspiring an audio drama. And uh, I was thinking about getting this for Pastor Brown for Christmas, the PC game, so that he could work on that on his study. I, I don't yeah. Whatever. Anyway, Left Behind tells the story of which true believers in Christ have been raptured. It's a very precious word. Leaving the world shattered and chaotic. And so uh, people scramble, a group scrambles to answer. But the Antichrist now comes to power, his name being Nikolai Carpathia, a gentleman from Romania. Uh, by the way, it's not uh, very accurate to the text of Scripture by any means. It's all fiction. And in response, this group to the Antichrist protests and calls themselves the Tribulation Force in order to save the lost around the world and prepare the world for the Tribulational period. Seems like the Tribulation Force might forget that there's 144,000 evangelists that do that kind of thing. And then, of course, we know that at the end of seven years, God comes down and he uh, brings judgment to the world, and that is the second coming. So in 1988, the first four books, uh, the first book of the series was put in the top slot, um, New York Times bestseller list. Now what's interesting is that New York Times bestseller list typically doesn't do Christian literature. But this is how impactful Left Behind is and was. Uh, book 10 debuted at number one on the list. Total sales of the series have passed, and this is dated, this is about two years old of information, 65 million copies. I couldn't find anything more modern than that. Seven titles in the series have reached number one on the bestseller list in the New York Times, USA Today, and Publishers Weekly. So we're talking about a cultural phenomenon that is extremely relevant in our society. The fervor here in 2019 has faded quite a bit. But I will say this, that Left Behind still stands as a leading influence in the teaching of the rapture, pre-tribulationism, pre-millennialism, and dispensational theology. A lot of evangelical Christians, instead of going to the scriptures, would rather say, well, I read the Left Behind series, so this is what I think. 
that is a problem because it's sad that the rapture has to be based on something that is fiction rather than a careful study of the Word of God. And so one understanding of the rapture is best left behind when reading left behind. Why? Because we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have a Bible that is authoritative, that is perfect, that is inspired, that doesn't have flaw. And so left behind has received also um, criticism as presenting out of touch or fringe theology that the majority of evangelical scholars these days rejects, and that is dispensationalism. You have to understand that if you're going to call yourself a dispensationalist, and uh, the tenets are rather simple. Number one, we believe that there is a distinction between the church and Israel. We're not the same entity. We take an inspired, progressive view of the Word of God, uh, I know that when I say progressive, some of you people who are in politics go, oh, I don't like that word. That's not what I'm talking about. But rather that God progressively revealed his word and his will in his way over a period of fifteen to 1,600 years in the writing of it. But Adam is not responsible for what the church does because he's Adam. He only has the direct word of God, no written word of God. And then this idea that we take the word of God literally, it says what it says and so if the bible is literal and it says what it says then we can believe by faith what it says i don't need a fictional series the idea that the rapture is fringe and out of touch is really a discouraging thought in modern christianity today um i've even heard this the word rapture doesn't even appear in the Bible, so therefore, why should we believe it? There once was a farmer who wanted to scare away crows, and so he took straw and put it inside of a man, and now you have that type of theological argument called a straw man. We'll address that. So let's first of all start out. What is the rapture? I mean, we have to define it first, don't we? We have to know and have a common idea of what we have. What is it we're talking about? Um, here's my definition, and if you want to tweak this, that's fine, but here's, here's my definition. The rapture of the church is a distinct event in which Jesus translates the church from the clouds of the air to heaven prior to the tribulation. That is my working definition of rapture. It's tweaked, it's changed a little bit, but there are some uh, key elements here that I think are, are very good to stand on. Um, so what I want to do for a moment is I want to take this idea of the rapture and what we're talking about the rapture, and I want to put it aside for a moment because I want to talk to you about a very serious issue, something that you are going to face, unless you're raptured, but we are put that aside for a moment. Death. What is death? Well, it's an established fact of human life, isn't it? Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 6 that he is ready to go home. For I am ready now to be offered at the time my departure is at hand. What is he talking about? <coughs> He's old. He knows that there's a trial and an execution on the docket. His life is spent. He is about to be murdered for the sake of Christ. It's time to go. He did well. He ran his race. The idea of my departure is at hand, my unloosing is at hand. What is he talking about? I think the loosing is what? It's the separation from the spirit and the body. Um, my father passed away three years ago. And one of the greatest thoughts that I had, so uh, in our town, the mandate is that when you place a body into the ground, it has to go into a concrete vault. So that way, if there's ever a tragedy like a flood, the coffin is not invaded and the body is not loose. 
And I told my son, I won't be able to see it, but Grampy is going to get that vault, and it is going to crack open, and he's coming out. But in that body right now is death. But is my father dead? No. He is in heaven. That body is done. Death has occurred on this earth, but yet my father's spirit is alive and well and in the presence of the king of kings. But we all understand the separation from the body and the soul. And all of us shall face death. Uh, Of course, you've heard the statement that there are two things that we cannot avoid, right? Death and taxes, yes. So when the spirit departs from the body, what occurs? Death. Uh, We are very familiar with the thought that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, judgment. So when we talk about death, we're really talking about separation, aren't we? Separation. Separation from the body. Um, Of course, there is an eternal consequence here, isn't there? Uh, If you don't know Christ as Savior and you are separated from your body, what is the tragedy? A literal judgment of hell. Yet if you know Christ as Savior, you have eternal life. Have you ever known a believer that has passed away? We've used this term, he's gone home to be with the Lord. The person doesn't cease to exist. They live now in a modified spiritual state in the presence of God. When Jesus dies on the cross, does he cease to exist? No. When he returns, three days after being dead, is he a spirit? He's modified, isn't he? He has a resurrection body. And so what's interesting is that when we talk about our loved ones being alive yet dead on this earth, how many of you have witnessed that and confirmed it is true? Let me rephrase the question. How many of you have entered heaven and seen the dead souls from earth there so that you can come back and testify it is true? None of us. In fact, I would say, is there any scientific evidence that proves that there is life after death? So can we at least say that I, by faith, believe that when a person dies, they are, if a believer, in heaven? It is a matter of faith. It is okay, and the simple answer is, why do you believe that? The Bible tells me so. That's not a bad answer, okay? So by faith, I believe what God says in his word about death to be true. But yet the Bible describes six events that seem to defy this established idea of death. It seems that when we talk about such events, there's different wording that is used, and based upon some of the different languages used in the verses, that there is a Latin word often used as translatio, or we see in some translations, translation. It means a carrying across, a removal, a transporting, or a transferring. transferring. It's different than death. So in a Bible study, the terms often relate to this idea of someone being translated. Some scholars have used the Greek word harpazo. It describes another event. It can mean to seize hastily, to be snatched up. It's used frequently to refer the snatching of something away. 
Uh, Paul uses it a few times, and we'll see these here in a moment. One final word that people describe. So translation, snatching away or caught up. One final word that is often used to describe this event that seems to defy death is a word that is used in the Latin Vulgate that Jerome translated in 405 A.D. It's called the Vulgate because it is translated into the vulgar language of common man so that they can read the Bible for themselves. When referring to the translation or being caught up, Jerome decides to use the Latin word raptoro. Raptoro. Of course, we get our English word, what? Rapture from raptoro. About 10% of Latin vocabulary has found its way into English. And so there are those that are going to try to be funny and say, I'm not going to believe in rapture because it's not in the Bible. Well, that's a deceptive response. It just matters what translation you read. It's not my fault you can't read Latin. It's certainly translated that way. Um, I don't think, by the way, that English people have dibs on the inspired translations. Amen? <laughs> um. Just because your translation does not have raptoro doesn't make it any better than the Vulgate. Doesn't make it any better than your Spanish Bible, your German Bible, your French Bible. Um, aren't there theological words that we hold to that are not identified particularly in Scripture? Of course, what about the word Trinity? Can anybody show me a verse where that one exists? No. The word Trinity is not there. Is the concept? Fully. Um, what about the word, oh, get this, Bible. Is the word Bible ever in the Bible? <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's a translation of the word book. And so do we throw rapture out because words like Trinity, Bible, or how about this, incarnation? I think Pastor Brown used incarnation this morning in his message. That word's not in the Bible either, so therefore we must throw it out. Let's be consistent at least, shouldn't we? You know, it doesn't matter what you call it. If you want to call it translation, caught up, rapture, there is scripture that seems to be signifying there is something going on that's different than death. And so let's talk about the six raptures of the Bible. Number one, Enoch. Enoch. Very interesting when we get to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. By faith, Enoch was what? Translated. That he should not see death. What in the world is that? And he was not found because God had what? Translated him. From before him translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. You can't get around the idea that Enoch has a unique experience in which bodily he is on earth, and the next moment, where is he? In the presence of God. So don't tell me that the rapture is an odd concept. We have Enoch. But that's not all. What about Elijah? Elijah. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, and then at the end, verse 17. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder, Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah went up by heaven, how? In a whirlwind. And they sought him three days, but they couldn't find him. Why couldn't they find him? He wasn't there. He wasn't there. This is, again, a rare, unique experience in which a man is translated into heaven in a form that we are not used to other than what we would say is common death. 
all. Maybe you're familiar with this one. Jesus. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, Jesus has already died and been resurrected, but he had a glorified, resurrected body. But here they are, now gathered around. And what happens to Jesus? Where'd he go? <coughs> Up. Where's heaven? Up. I don't know where. <laughs> and so the angels, hey, fellas, why are you standing around here gawking up in the sky? you got some work to do. Get to work. But Jesus' transference into heaven is not a normal event, is it? It's special and it's unique. I would say he was raptured. Um, This one is a little bit tricky. I don't understand the nuances of this, and I'm glad I don't because Paul says that he doesn't. (laughs) Um, In in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2, we've got a very uh, strange idea. And what I think here is Paul is not identifying himself as Paul here. He doesn't say, I But he's going to give us a story about a man that he knew that went through a certain event. I happen to think most likely it was when he was stoned. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I don't know, I can't tell. Or whether out of the body, I don't know, I can't tell. So what is he saying? I don't know if this man was dead and resurrected, or this man was raptured and sent back, I can't tell. I don't know. But such a one was, whoop, caught up. Caught up in the third heaven, presence of God. This is the word, the idea, the concept of rapture. We're not done yet, still got to keep going, right? What about Revelation? Uh, If you want to follow your Revelation timeline, there are two witnesses in the tribulation that come and bring judgment. They are brutally murdered and set out on display so that their bodies can be seen. What happens after they are murdered? They are resurrected. Revelation chapter 11, verse 12 says, And then I heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Where did they go? Heaven. How did they get there? I would at least use a general concept, is that they were raptured up. They were seized. They were taken. They were cut up. They were translated. Whatever word you want to use. There's multiple ideas. And so these are five times in Scripture in which this concept of translation caught up and rapture are used together to describe peculiar events that are not like normal death. And so if we see these events taking place in Scripture, it is not out of the realm of theology that this event can happen again because God has used it in the past. Revelation is in the future and it shall happen. But there is the rapture that we want to talk about, and that is here, uh, rapture of the church, the bride of Christ. There are a few texts that we want to deal with here. Um, First of all, let me give you 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. We'll come back to this here in a moment. But Then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord In the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So, my first thought is this, that the rapture of the church is not out of line with what God has already done inside Scripture. One of the largest critiques about the rapture is that there is no biblical evidence for such an event. It is uncommon 
No. Now, I'm not saying it is common. It is rare and unique. But if we were to only have the rapture of the church as the only available illustration, then that would be a fair debate to have. But it's not, is it? Rapture happens. It is not common, but it happens. Let's look at the five principles of the rapture. And I'm going to draw from three texts of Scripture that I think I have listed on your handout. The three texts of Scripture are John 14, 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. Uh, I will post uh, some snippets on the screen behind me so you can see them. Of course, we know in John 14, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. I love that song when I was a kid. I've got a mansion just over the... Well, I now have better theology. I say, I've got a dwelling place just over the hill. That, it just doesn't rhyme, but you know. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Okay? This is a rather interesting statement. How many of you have ever thought of John 14 and said, Rapture! Probably not many. But look at the last phrase, that there, where I am, there you may be also. The thought here, is this a rapture, or is it Jesus' second coming? Is it a rapture, or Jesus' second coming? I'm going to address that thought, but I want you to keep it in your mind. The second text. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. Behold, I show you a mystery. Um, I have a fellow in my church that describes mystery this way. It's kind of neat. So uh, the Jews are on one mountaintop, and they're looking for the end times, the establishment of the kingdom. And boy, they are missing everything in between. <laughs> it's a mystery. They're looking mountaintop to mountaintop and not seeing the beautiful lush valleys that are preparing for the next mountaintop. We shall not all sleep. Oh, good. None of us are sleeping today. That's not the word. What's the word? Die. You shall not all die. But we shall be all changed in a moment. How fast? A twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. That is not presidential. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal body must put on what? Immortality. There is going to be an event, a translation, a catching up, a seizing, a rapture that is a mystery now. In that those who are dead shall be resurrected into their glorified bodies. And it's going to happen instantaneously. Can you see a twinkling of an eye? No. No. We shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. Okay, there's a very familiar idea that we just brought over from our last verse. Then we which are alive and remain shall be raptured up together with them. Where? In the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Does Jesus ever step down onto planet earth at this event in 1 Thessalonians. Where is he? He's in the air. This is why John 14 must be rapture. Because if he is coming and we are caught up with him, why in the world would we do a U-turn and come right back? It doesn't make sense. I think I have five principles about what a rapture is for the church. Number one, Christ will descend 
from heaven with a shout and the blast of a trumpet to the air above the earth. That is the descriptor. Principle number two. The souls of dead Christians will descend from heaven with Jesus at this coming. They will be risen. Their bodies shall be risen. Number three. The bodies of dead Christians will be raised as perfect bodies and will be reunited with their returning spirit. It's a reuniting. It's rather interesting. So where are our dead loved ones right now? They're in the presence of the Lord, right? But yet, what is the purpose of the body being resurrected from this earth? They receive their glorified body. And where do they receive it? In the clouds of the air. In the clouds of the air. Principle four, the bodies of Christians who are alive will be instantly changed into a perfect body. We will be raptured to meet our Lord both the dead Christians and alive Christians will meet together with Jesus in the clouds. All Christians will return with Jesus to heaven to live in the dwelling places that he has prepared for them. So, the rapture of the church is unique. Every year typically i do a series called ask the pastor i think you do ask the pastor um we relabeled it's ask the pasta because we're new englanders you know ask the pasta um one of the questions that i got a few years ago was pasta are you sure that the rapture is different than the second coming because that's really this debate here those that would say there is no rapture of the church are referring to the second coming. Now, I'm going to go out on a theological limb here. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Please. No matter who you are, you must, you must, you must believe in a rapture. Because the alive Christians have to meet Jesus in the clouds of the air at some point. It just depends on when you believe it happens. So for people to say, ah, that rapture stuff, I don't believe it. They're wrong. They do. They're just saying, I don't believe that it happens prior to the second coming. After the tribulation, prior to the millennium. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you the differences between the rapture and the second coming. I can't spend a lot of time on this. I apologize there's only 19 differences. I'm trying to get it to 20. That's such a clean number. But my conscience would only let me do 19. So here's what we're going to do. You have a large chart on your sheet. Please don't look at it. I'm going to give you all 19. I want you to hold your breath because here we go. Are you ready? Rapture, not mentioned in the Old Testament. Second coming is mentioned in both Testaments. Rapture occurs prior to the tribulation. Second coming occurs following the tribulation. Rapture, it is a mystery. Second coming, it is not a mystery we know the general time frame, maybe not the day or the hour, but we know the time frame. Rapture. No prophecies or signs must be fulfilled prior to the rapture. Second coming. Oh, there's a ton of stuff that has to happen biblically prior to Jesus stepping back on earth. Rapture. It's imminent. Second coming. It's not imminent. It takes place after the seven-year tribulation. Again, no man knows the day or the hour, but do we have a general concept that it comes after the tribulation? And so in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Jesus says, you be ready. Rapture, the angel, the archangel heralds the event. Second coming, a cosmic sign from heaven precedes the sounding of the trumpet. Matthew 24. Rapture, Christ gathers the saints. Second coming, 
That should say the angels spell check. <laughs> the angels gather the elect at the second coming. Rapture. Christ does not come to earth. He comes where? In the air, the clouds. Second coming, Christ comes to where? We saw in the last session. On to the Mount of Olives, physically. Rapture, Christ's appearance is not visible to people on earth because it happens when? In the twinkling of an eye. But listen to this, friends. All eyes shall see Jesus Christ at the second coming. There will be no mistaken identity. Rapture, Christ comes for his church. Second coming, Christ comes. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, he comes with the armies, but we're coming with them. Not meeting them up there, doing something in the clouds and coming back. We are coming. Rapture, Christ takes believers to heaven. Second coming, believers remain on earth to enter the messianic kingdom to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Rapture removes believers from the earth. Second coming removes unbelievers from the earth. Rather interesting. One shall be taken and the other left. Oh, is that the rapture? No. The one that are taken are taken to damnation. Rapture. Christians receive a glorified body preparing them for eternity. Second coming. Survivors of the tribulation remain in their natural bodies to enter the millennial kingdom as human beings, not glorified or resurrected saints. Rapture, it's a message of comfort and hope. Comfort one another with these words. The second coming is not a message of hope. It's a message of wrath and the judgment of Jesus Christ because what is coming out of his mouth? A sword. The rapture does not bring divine judgments to this earth. The second coming brings severe judgments to this earth. The rapture, believers are evaluated, rewarded, and married to Christ following the rapture. What judgment do we have to look forward to? The Bema. Yet, in the second coming, the nations are judged following the tribulation. This is not the Bema. This is the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Rapture, there is no mention of Satan in connection with the rapture at all. Yet in the second coming, Satan is bound for a thousand years following Christ's return. In the rapture, the tribulation begins after the rapture, when the Antichrist makes a covenant with the nation of Israel, and at the second coming, the millennial kingdom begins after Christ's second coming. Now, I know that I did not go through every single Bible verse. I don't have that kind of time. It's here. It's here. The chart's there for your personal research. We come to our conclusion here. The big question is what? When? When? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Oh, I've got about six minutes to finish this. I took five messages of 45 minutes apiece to preach through this verse in my church a few years ago. So let me give you the cliff notes. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, the hour of trial, which shall come upon all the world. To try them that dwell upon the earth, behold, I come quickly. Hold fast, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. The Lord promises the believers here in the church of Philadelphia a very special promise that they shall not endure a trial. The word keep from is a very interesting Greek thought of tereo ek. It's a phrase that gives the notion of an evacuation from the earth 
prior to something that is troublesome, a trial that is coming. And Jesus says, the church will not go through this hour. I'm not saying that the word evacuation here means it's not the word rapture, but I do find that the word evacuation really does describe a rapture event, does it not? It's the keeping from, it's the taking out of. Tereo is the Greek word to keep, to preserve, to protect. And the Greek preposition ek means out of. Uh, when reading people who deny the rapture, they come to this text. The only thing that they can do to deny the rapture in this text is to say that the word ek does not mean out. I think they have bad theology. <laughs> they have bad grammar. Now, we believe in the inspired word of God, verbally inspired. So even if God puts a little word as ek, out of, do you know what he means? He means out of. He means ek. Um, there's no way. You have to redefine the Greek word to mean something it does not mean to get rid of that thought if you're going to deny rapture here. Uh, people often try to translate it as through, through. If I translated that word when I was in seminary as through, I would fail my quiz. It doesn't work. It is out of. But if the Lord had meant, I'm going to keep believers through the hour of trial, what kind of hope is that to the Church of Philadelphia? It's not much hope, because if you're going to read the rest of the book of Revelation, do you want to go through that? Certainly not. Tarot Ek is the New Testament idea used in John 17, 15. Jesus says, I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Jesus uses this idea and says, Father, would you please keep them, the saints, through the evil one? Oh, I hope not. Out of, out of the evil one. And so Revelation 3.10 promises a protection of believers from going through something that is known as the hour of trial. Revelation 7, 9 through 14 presents millions of believers that are martyred during the tribulation. Some would ask, well, if there are martyrs during the tribulation, how does that work? Well, if you have to have the idea that if the church is removed, are there going to be saved people after the church is removed? Yes. That is the whole purpose for the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. People will turn to Christ during the tribulation. The Lord promises to keep his people not out of a testing, but from a time, an hour of testing. Our exemption is just not from a few trials and tribulations, but from the very terminology of the tribulation itself. I believe it means that the church is exempt from an hour or a time period in which a testing occurs. Who is the hour of tribulation actually for? What purpose does the tribulation serve to or for the church? None. None. If you're going to be consistent in your Old Testament theology, there is only one people that the tribulation is for, and that is to reassemble the family of Jacob once again. It is Jacob's trial. It is Jacob's hour. It is Jacob's testing. I am not of the lineage of Israel, Jacob. I am in the church. If the church will experience any or all of the coming tribulation, then one would naturally expect that the most in-depth, lengthy presentation of the tribulation would include the church's role inside the tribulation period. But remarkably, do you know what happens after Revelation chapter 6? 
the word church disappears from the book. The Greek word for church, ekklesia, occurs 20 times in Revelation. It's in chapters 1 through 3, 19 times. Jesus addresses his seven letters to the seven specific churches of Asia Minor. Then suddenly, at the beginning of Revelation chapter 4, it's gone. It does not appear until Revelation chapter 18 when, guess what happens? Jesus now comes back. So if the, if the church is missing from the majority of content, I'd propose to you it's because it's been raptured. In Revelation 4.1, John, who is a member of the church, is called up to heaven, projected into the future, and so that church is now missing in the tribulation period. When we find ecclesia in Revelation 22.16, it's one final time in usage. The place of the church in the book of Revelation shows that we are with Christ, not on the earth. Here's, just to conclude, what we've covered. The word rapture, even though rejected by many people, while not a common experience in Scripture, it happens multiple times. Leading us to the thought that the rapture of the church is not a wacky thought, because it is in line with what God has already done, and we already know the two witnesses in Revelation shall be caught up and translated. Number two, there is biblical evidence that shows us that this rapture is radically different in 19 different ways than what we do know as the second coming of Christ. They can't be the same. I've been trying for four years to mesh those 19 points together. Now, I admit, I'm not the brightest of guys, but I haven't been able to do it yet. They are different and distinct. And then we come to the text of Revelation chapter 3, where we are promised, or the church in Philadelphia at least, is promised to be kept out of. They're not going through, but out of Jacob's trouble, the hour of trial. I'm two minutes over, but I had a little padding on that. So, questions? David. Great question. Um, one of my favorite texts in Scripture, and I'm going to take the classical uh, Ryrie dispensational view. There is no church in Matthew 24 and 25. What I take is Matthew 24 and 25 is a descriptor. It is a blueprint of what is going to come. If you want a detailed version of my view, go to Shepherd's Haven from two years ago on Facebook, and my presentation's on there. That'll give you a better explanation. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I personally don't separate Messianic Jews from the church. Um, I don't think personally uh, ethnicity has anything to do with salvation. If a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they are saved, they are permanently inswelt, they are sealed with the Holy Spirit, they are God's forever. So whatever they want to do to attend whatever group or church makes no difference to me, they are saved. So uh, if a Jew happens to believe on Christ, he's now part of the church, even if he wants to be in a Messianic assembly. Um, 144,000, I think they're sent from the Lord. Uh, maybe not necessarily as supernatural beings, but rather, if you look at the technicality of who they are and where they come from, where, who, are, who are they? They're the 12 tribes of Israel that God has restored. How many tribes on Israel of Israel do we have on earth right now that we know of? Two and a half. <laughs> Why do I say two and a half? Well, Judah, the Jews, Benjamin was part of that, 
And there trickled a few Levites over into the Babylonian captivity, and that, and that came about. So where are the other ten tribes? They were judged by Assyria. They were scattered all over the earth. We don't know where they are. However, in the end times, what God shall do is he now will bring these covenant people together. And that's why the tribulation has to be about Jacob. This is the restoration of God's promises to God's people in which he'll restore that. Great question. Thank you. Okay.